Okay, and welcome back. So after that speed run through the 19th and first half of the 20th century, to give you a sense of how we got to the middle of the 20th century, we're not going to slow down. Uh, we're going to do some of the side quests. And what I mean by that is we're going to explain what art was like at the middle of the 20th century. And I think this is very important because you can't understand contemporary art. You can't understand pop art, which pops up out of nowhere. Ah, oh, jeez. I'm sorry. I don't try this. The dad jokes, they just come naturally. I have three kids. Give me a break. Uh, it just pops up out of nowhere uh, in the middle of the 1950s and explodes onto the scene in the 1960s. But it doesn't come out of nowhere. There's a lot percolating under the surface, and it has to do with the incredible success of abstract expressionism, and particularly the New York School. That is that all of the ideas that people had been experimenting with over the last 50 years finally become mainstream. And I mean totally and completely mainstream. That they are part and parcel of this vast post-World War II consumer culture that is created in the 1940s and 50s. So let's get into it. Why does it happen here? Why does it happen in New York City? And the answer is that New York City is a city of exiles. Remember, uh, Nazis come to power in 1933. By 1933, 1934, they have shut down the Bauhaus in Dessau, Germany. Uh, it doesn't last much longer in Berlin. Uh, people like Max Beckmann get booted out of their position in Frankfurt, uh, Germany. Uh, Kette Kollwitz gets booted. A lot of these people had found teaching positions as, uh, and as art instructors in universities, and most of them lose their positions in the purge. Many of them are Jewish and have no desire to hang around for what they can see coming, and they leave. And they leave in a series of uh, waves of exiles. They start leaving uh, first from Germany, then wind up leaving, uh, you know, Paris and and Denmark and elsewhere because those places are also conquered and then they move to England and then finally England comes under the Blitz 4041 so it seems like the only safe place to go is the United States and some of them are some of the biggest names that we know from this time period so Piet Mondrian who was this Dutch painter who uh, pioneers this extreme abstraction of De Steel. He comes to New York. Ferdinand Leger, who was one of the first Cubists who was exhibited in, that, um, in the Autumn Salon in 1911. He's there, Max Ernst. Max Ernst was also a Dadaist and also very instrumental in Surrealism. André Breton, who was the founder of Surrealism and wrote the Surrealist uh, Manifesto. All kinds of people, including Bill de Kooning. Bill de Kooning's a Dutch artist who comes to America. And everybody comes, but some of them stay. Some of them decide to make their new life in New York City. Some of them return after the war. And it's not just artists. It's a whole host of intellectuals. Uh, you know, Richard Krautheimer, very famous architectural historian, comes over. Erwin uh, Panofsky. Uh, comes over and he eventually uh, winds up at Princeton. Erwin Panofsky's an art historian. Uh, this is true across the board. Um, some of the great and most prominent scholars of what we call the Frankfurt School, uh, Marcuse and Adorno, uh, German scholars, they end up coming and end up working at places like UCLA, Berkeley, etc. And But New York is where most of them come because that's the major, major hub. So remember that as we were working in the period between the wars, the goal of modern artists between the wars was this recapturing of meaning. Dadaism pretty much encapsulated the feelings of people at the end of World War I. That meaning was dead. How could you possibly say that art could have any meaning or that life could have any meaning? And so they had completely deconstructed meaning. So it was a new search for meaning. And there's two ways to go about this. One is to go in the direction of pure abstraction, to go in the direction of Kazimir Malevich, Mondrian, uh, De Steel, and other movements that abstract in itself was a form of expression, that you were going to totally remove yourself from 
from the past, create something that was non-objective, complete reduction of form, often geometric. And so abstraction comes to the fore. And the reason abstraction is so popular is because abstraction is pure. It's seen as this kind of pure aesthetic. You don't have to explain it. You know, non-objective art by Vasily Kandinsky, what is it? It is what it is. That black square by Malevich, what is it? My students really don't know. It's a black square. There's nothing more to it than that. It is what it is. It's this attempt to get down to reality and truth. The other direction that people go is surrealism. And surrealism is this idea that, okay, we're going to create something objective, but going back to the iconography of the past, of Christianity, of what the symbolists were doing, that just wasn't going to cut it anymore. So we needed a new iconography, a new visual vocabulary. So we went to things like the interpretation of dreams, the, the theories of Sigmund Freud. We started delving into the subconscious, allowing ourselves to explore the self, which was something that was relatively new. You know, this, this idea that you could explore the self for meaning was, would have been considered ridiculously self-absorbed uh, in uh, the 19th century. You know, they preferred a stoic resolve, and you find meaning outside yourself. And one of the methods that evolves out of this is psychic automatism, this drive to find the composition as you are creating it. It's very process-oriented. That is, you jump into it and you just create. You do not have something in mind. So just like a word association or an ink blot, you don't come to it with an image. The image comes out of you spontaneously in a kind of intuitive process and it creates these organic forms that you later kind of resolve. We call this biomorphism because the things are biomor biomorphic. That biomorphic means they, they look like life forms, like single-celled organisms and other things. These two ideas, this, this method of psychic automatism, of expression, of finding spontaneity, and abstraction, total removal of any kind of objective representation, and pure reduction of form come together, as you can see in this phenomenal diagram, to create what we call abstract expressionism, where it takes the psychic automatism, the spontaneity, the improvisational technique and process of the biomorphic psychic automatism, and it fuses it with this pure abstraction and unlike the psychic automatism and biomorphism, which still has a kind of representation, they get rid of it. And it could only happen in a place like New York because it's the only place that all of these people were at, where they were all coming together and experimenting and looking at these things. And so this is what creates abstract expressionism. So abstract expressionism is... Uh, really a term defined by the critic Harold Rosenberg. Harold Rosenberg called this stuff action painting, that you find it in the process. And the reason he called it action painting is that instead of painting, you know, scenes of action, you were active in the creation of it. You really attacked the canvas. And you can see that. And this aligned with a lot of improvisational forms that were happening at the same time. We were having experiments in poetry. It's not an accident that the beatnik poetry comes out of the same period, the late 1940s, early 1950s, where you would stand up there. I'm sure you all know the beatnik poetry. It's, oh my gosh, it's a terrible stereotype and cliche now. It's the place where you go to a beat bar, people wear berets and black turtlenecks and smoke uh, cigarettes and drink coffee, and instead of applauding, they, oh yeah, it's deep, man, they, uh, they snap. It's a, it's, a, it's a Hollywood cliche at this point. But at the time, that was really innovative this you know this improvisational poetry without form that existed and it's very similar to jazz jazz is also an improvisational art form i'll never forget the time i went to uh, a jazz club in uh, philadelphia my friend invited me i'm not a big jazz connoisseur um, but i really wanted to experience it and it was amazing uh, I, I remember being there and, and thinking wow I've, I've been listening to this for 20 minutes I haven't heard a recognizable theme since the first five minutes. The saxophone <laughs> has gone into his second solo. Time has no meaning. <laughs> this is just intense. It was just wave of wave. And it was impressive 
to hear them do that, to just create this, and they knew how to make it this form. Well, you could think of the painting of the, of the abstract expressionists to be the same process. You have a few simple rules that you set down, and then if you follow those rules, everything else branches out from that. And if it's one thing that's interesting about this is the technique actually removes the artist from the process. You have a few set simple rules, but infinite variation within those rules. So this is the first movement, really, that isn't stylistically unified in the way that even, you know, post-impressionists post weren't terribly stylistically unified either, but, but even more so. That is, you can group things together by a style, but many of the abstract expressionists look completely different from each other. They're all abstract, they're all expressionist, they all have a different method of removing themselves from the process, and that creates an ideological movement. It is not the style that unifies them, it is the concept behind the style. And that's critical, that's really critical, because it shows that at some point the concept has become more important than the output. And that will become very important as we get into contemporary art later on. When you have an art form that emphasizes your process and emphasizes the ideology behind that process, you're really making conceptual art. Now, the abstract expressionists, at the end of the day, still have these massive, monumental, 20-foot-wide paintings that, you know, they, they could sell for millions, and they were still object, but you have to have that kind of break between your process and the ultimate painting. It ceases to be image-making. That's a fascinating thing, is that, with the exception of maybe de Kooning, they're not making images anymore. Even before this, people were making images. When Malevich is reducing it to a square, he's still making an image. He's making a square. But at this point, they're no longer making images anymore. They're making experiences. And remember what we said about contemporary art. Contemporary art is about experiences. So in a way, contemporary art can said to be just the next step. It liberates the abstract expressionists from the need for an object. So it's not as much a repudiation as you might think. So the person who was behind all of this, um, other than Errol Rosenberg, was probably Clement Greenberg. Clement Greenberg uh, had already established himself as a writer and a thinker with his very famous Art and Kitsch in 1939, and he was hanging out in New York City at this time. And in fact, all of these people kind of come together. We have a whole collection of artists that are active and you can look through this, some of the important ones that you can see. Robert Motherwell is here, Jackson Pollock, it's really kind of incredible. Dead center, you got Barnett Newman and Rothko off to the side. So you have a whole collection of individuals that were all actively involved in these ideas, and they were all in Lower Manhattan. And it's not just artists, you have artists from Europe, artists from America, but you also have art critics. Clement Greenberg was right there in the mix. So this is another thing that's unusual about this time period. In addition to, in addition to the artists all kind of being there at the same time, you have the art critics and art historians like Meyer Shapiro who are hanging out with these same artists. So, and for, you know, it's very rare. Usually what happens is an artist makes something, then the critic looks at it and says, eh, I like it, eh, I don't, here's why. And then the artists have to respond to the critics. But you have artists and critics mingling socially together in the same places at this time, and it allows them to feed off their ideas. So Clement Greenberg was really committed to this idea of high art freeing the artist and getting closer to truth at this progressive ideal. And he was hanging around in the same places that these artists were hanging around and they were exchanging ideas. So I think he had the opportunity to really shape this movement. And so what were they all doing in Lower Manhattan? Lower Manhattan was dirt cheap. That's the truth. 
That's why they were there. I know, if you go to Soho and Greenwich Village today, they are not dirt cheap. They are pretty darn bougie. They've been completely gentrified. I love that line out of Age of Ultron where uh, Captain America comes back and they say, hey, are you going to move back into Brooklyn? He says, I don't think I can afford Brooklyn. It's true. Uh, all of Manhattan has gone bougie. Um, you know, even the naked city has gone bougie. It's, it's crazy. But these were lower class, working class, crime filled neighborhoods once upon a time that were full of warehouses and stores and shops and factories and things like that. So they were in those places because you could get cheap loft space. That's the answer to it. You could find a space that was a, you know, a studio that you could actually paint at. And that's why they were there. And so they were in this cheap place. And we have this collection of people that come together and we call them the New York School. Now it's not a formal school. It's not anything like a formal school. It's just a group of like-minded individuals that gathered together. And amazingly, they gathered together in one place. And that is the Cedar Tavern. And the Cedar Tavern was a dive bar. It was an absolute, it was the kind of bar that longshoremen and teamsters would hang out in. And when asked why they, you know, hung out in that bar, uh, Jackson Pollock was just very honest about it. He said, because the booze was cheap. And he said, that's why we hung out there. Uh, you know, we, it was, had nothing to do with anything else. You know, they weren't intentionally slumming it. In those early days in the 1940s, they were desperately poor. Uh, that's why they were there. You could get cheap loft space, so you could actually have places to paint, and you could get cheap booze. And they formed something they call the Art Club. And they called it the Art Club, but it was a, a purely informal club. And uh, they describe it that, you know, everybody would put in a dollar, and that would be enough to buy a bottle of Jack or a bottle of something, and they would, they would get a tiny little Dixie cup, and everybody would get some but it usually wasn't enough to go around. And then they would invite somebody to come speak. And they would either hang out in the Cedar Tavern, sometimes they would go to place at the Art Student League in, in New York City. And they would just shoot the ball. And they would sometimes get somebody in to talk to them. John uh, Cage, uh, the very famous musician and uh, founder of Black Mountain College, which is this radical arts college in North Carolina at the time, they got him to speak. He was into Zen Buddhism. And so he talked about Zen Buddhism and about how you have this spontaneous generation in Zen art. And they thought that was really interesting. And then there were a bunch of other of these, you know, exiles, refugees, wanderers, you know, hanging around. And it was this lively environment. And what's interesting is slowly over the course of the late 1940s into the 1950s, it ceased to be a place that, you know, attracted longshoremen and Teamsters and now attracted these bohemian crazy artists and some of the most uh, famous people are there and they all interacted so up there in the top you have that's Bill de Kooning's white shock of hair he's always recognizable and then I think that's his wife uh, Elaine de Kooning who was every bit as much as uh, a part or a center of the group as anybody else and so all these artists would hang out there it became a, a a kind of bohemian place and the stories they tell about the Cedar Tavern are really quite extraordinary. Uh, by the 1950s when it had become you know a kind of hip hipster place and they'd driven off all the teamsters and working class people there were famous artists and critics who were coming there routinely and there was one who said you know I, I still haven't met Bill de Kooning and somebody said well that's him over there and he realized he never recognized him before he thought he was just some uh, drunk. He had actually seen him passed out on the street in front <laughs> and never uh, <laughs> never realized that he was this famous artist. Uh, uh, Jackson Pollock got booted from the tavern because he kicked in a, a, a door on a bathroom stall. Another famous artist got uh, booted because he uh, was drunk and urinated in the sink in the bathroom. Uh, one of my favorite stories is that uh, Clement Greenberg was there and... Um, <laughs> and Bill de Kooning, he had he had written a, uh, Clement Greenberg had written a very scathing critique of uh, de Kooning. Uh, de Kooning was was probably the most popular in the late 1940s, early 1950s. But by the late 1950s, he was considered passe, and uh, Clement Greenberg had written a very scathing report of him, a critique of him. And Bill de Kooning came in and 
and said, you know, I don't know. And it got to be this big shoving match. And and uh, he said, let's go outside, take this outside. I'm going to punch you. And Clem Greenberg says, no, I'm not going to. I'm going to punch you. And then so and then so Kooning said he was going to punch him right there. So Clement Greenberg got punched out by Bill de Kooning in the middle of the Cedar Tavern. Lots of stories. Lots of things happened. Uh, what can I say? They were a bunch of womanizing drunks. <laughs> That's just the truth. Uh, they uh, swapped partners and lives and... Uh, it's amazing any of them got out alive. In fact, most of them didn't. And But it was this incredible dynamic place. What's funny is that the Cedar Tavern, it actually killed the Cedar Tavern. Because, of course, when you create a space like this that's all hip and everybody wants to go to it, then the Teamsters and the working class people go away. Those are your regulars. But then eventually the Bohemians will get bored. They'll move on to the next place. And the Teamsters and the uh, working class people won't come back. So in a way, it was kind of a blessing and a curse for the Cedar Tavern. It immortalized it as this locus where people would change, you know, exchange ideas about art, but it ultimately kind of destroyed the the uh, the business. So they were all exchanging these ideas. They were talking directly to critics. They were talking to people from all over Europe, and many of them were from Europe or elsewhere themselves, and they all came together in this moment to create this art. So let's talk about some of it. One of the kind of founding members is Arshil Gorky. Arshil Gorky himself was a refugee twice over. Uh, he escaped the Armenian genocide as a kid and went to Russia, uh, dropped his Armenian name and adopted Gorky. Uh, he was actually born Vazdanik Odoyan and uh, he changed his name to Arshil Gorky. Uh, Gorky was the name of a famous Russian writer and uh, Arshil is Achilles. So, you know, this, they all had these kind of invented identities about themselves. So he'd spent a lot of time in uh, in Russia, but also Paris, and eventually came to New York and settled in New York. And people commented on it that when he was, he had been in New York long enough that, you know, he still had a slight accent, but his accent got more pronounced whenever he was in uh, the company of critics or people in the Cedar Tavern. It's really kind of remarkable. And he is really credited as the first to break through with this, uh, you know, idea of abstract expressionism. He is the one that takes the biomorphism and the psychic automatism and crosses over. Uh, he was, like a lot of these artists, uh, employed by the Work Projects Administration. The Work Projects Administration was one of the New Deal programs. It was part of the NRA. Uh, the NRA was the National Recovery Act, not the National Rifle Association. Just there's lots of different acronym, acronyms in the world. Sooner or later, they're going to line up. And so he was painting stuff like this. This was a, a mural that he did in 1937. He's clearly working. You can see on the biomorphism of the surrealists. But his challenge here was to create something that was a recognizable form that fit the context, which was a mural for a new airport that went up in Newark, New Jersey. And it's while he's in the Work Projects Administration that he meets people like Jackson Pollock and others because they all worked for uh, the Work Projects Administration during the Depression. There wasn't a lot of work for artists. And so the government employed artists making murals for things like airports, post offices, things like that. And he is the first to kind of, he could see him working towards this direction in the late 30s. World War II comes along and a lot of these artists find different work to support the war effort. Uh, and in this case, here you can see how he starts moving away from biomorphism into kind of pure expression of forms. And his technique is very interesting. He will take a line and just create a freeform line and the line will overlap itself and intersect creating forms. And then he will accentuate those forms by painting color back into them. Or sometimes it's the reverse. Sometimes he will paint a kind of lozenge shape with color and then he will outline it. And so you can see that this spontaneous generation of form is creating shapes and impressions and pure expressions. You can see it when it, you compare it to something like um, Miro's The Escape Ladder. But Miro would always resolve these into faces. You can see him putting eyes and, and limbs on things. Miro would always try to give these things an identity. They were still shapes and forms. The process by which he got them was random, but eventually he would 
solidify them in his imagination into something a bit more recognizable. But that was not the case with Gorky. Gorky would actually just leave them forms and decided not to push them and force them to be conformed to his imagination. He would just create them. And so you can see how he'll put down an area of one color and then outline it very quickly with another. You have that same kind of energetic brushstroke that you see in the Expressionists, for example, but this time completely freed from any desire to do any kind of representation. It has the same kind of energy as a Kandinsky, but Kandinsky stuff is more deliberate. Kandinsky is sitting there looking at the composition, okay, oh, I need something here, something here. Whereas this isn't. This is something that is created spontaneously. You can see how he creates these spaces, just, uh, you know, outlining them, creating forms, and then putting the color inside of them, or sometimes creating the color and then outlining them afterwards. But they never ever turn into things. They are always just forms that exist. Arshil Gorky then is usually given credit as the person who crosses over into abstract expressionism. Now what's interesting is that uh, he has all of these guys have very, well with the exception of Bill de Kooning, we'll talk about him in a minute, but the exception of all of them is that they all of them had very kind of brief lives. Arshil Gorky's uh, wife, uh, I think, cheated on him, and this uh, caused him to go out and hang himself. And so he's gone by 1948. So it's interesting, is right as these people's art starts to hit, uh, their self-destructive behavior uh, kind of catches up with them. Uh, probably the most eminent of all of the abstract expressionists in the late 1940s would have been Bill de Kooning, Willem de Kooning who was gone mostly by Bill, uh, who became fully Americanized. Heavy drinking, heavily womanizing, uh, often got into fights, uh, very obstreperous personality, obnoxious guy. Uh, and his method was, rather than kind of just going over the canvas and finding these forms, his method is what he called um, desperation. And that is that you had to be willing to lose a painting in order to find it. He said, I like to get all the colors in the world into one painting. I was never interested in how to make a good painting, but to see how far one could go. And you can see that in his early works, he's still creating form of all the abstract expressionists. He's the one that never gave up on representation. He usually had some kind of figure. And of course, women were the more popular of his figures. This one, you can see he kind of creates a construction. It starts off as a kind of surrealist, almost biomorphic shape, but then especially in the face, you see that what, what we talk about desperation, that, that color being pushed further and further until it's just a muddy mess. There's some control in the lower half of the painting. And it's that energy, that brushwork, you know, it's very similar to the brushwork of Kokoschka or, you know, Soutine or others, you know, just energetic painting. That's what really attracted him. And that's what he starts really moving into, the painting and the overpainting. He usually had a model or something he was looking at, but he did that just because he wanted something there to hold his attention so that he didn't wander into creating something from his imagination. It was just a springboard for this action. And he was noted for painting and overpainting constantly. I mean, if you look at a painting, many of his paintings have 30, 40 layers of paint, and he's just obliterated whole compositions, just painting over it, pushing himself to where he's at this moment of desperation. Again, there's something of a process here. This, the, the thing that matters is this concept. Again, elevating concept and process over the final outcome and using process as a way to achieve the outcome. And you can see it in his paintings. You can see how they get muddy, layer and layer of, of color over the top of each other. This one, you can actually only barely see traces of the original yellow and pink and green, where he's obliterated it with black and white 
uh, moving furiously over it. If you've ever seen uh, a de Kooning painting in person, you'll notice that there are dents and divots in the canvas and sometimes holes. He is hitting this so hard with the brushes, it's almost like he's attacking it. He's stabbing it. Here you can see, this is the first of his very famous woman series, which kind of cemented his reputation. And you can see in that upper corner, that starburst, how he's, you know, just painted it until it's just a muddy mess and then driven white paint back into it. Same thing with the figure itself. It all just kind of starts to lose it. And it's only at that moment where he could feel like a sense of he was losing a painting that he was happy with it. Now, the thing about it is that this process, how do you know when you're done? And the truth is he didn't really know when he was done. Uh, he was notorious for continuing on his paintings and never ever really finishing in paintings. The first, his first major ex exhibition, uh, he refused to let anybody hang the paintings. And so he hung the paintings himself when the gallery owner came in he found him in the gallery, still painting on the paintings of the show that was supposed to go up in hours. So when the people came in, the, the paint was still wet on the canvas. And he wanted to have this, this absolute energy. Uh, and you can see that energy. And this is the kind of, I mean, this is just far more than anything ever achieved in the modern period in terms of energy. And that's the key of abstract expressionist paintings. You find them in the making of them. You do not find them in you know by sitting back and looking at the canvas and thinking it's not an intellectual act it is an experiential act you find it in the process of making it creating these things but by um the mid 1950s uh he was still doing iterations of these women and and that's when Clement Greenberg said, well, there's, there's really much more interesting things going on. That's when they had their uh, their row and their fisticuffs in uh, the Cedar Tavern. And then he never, ever really adjusted after that. It's interesting that all of these guys started out just insanely dirt poor. You know, they were, uh, you know, they, they were living in the YMCA. They were living in hostels and um, sleeping on the floors of their friend places, uh, what we would call couch surfing. Uh, they had virtually no money. But when they hit their fame in the late 40s, early 50s, it was massive and it was international. And at that point, they did become quite successful. Uh, you know, de Kooning was regularly selling paintings for ten and $20,000. And this is at a time period where, you know, the median income is 11000 so median income is around fifty thousand today. Medium income, you know, median income was around eleven thousand then. Eleven, you know, you could buy a car for, you know, a thousand. You could buy a house, you know, for you know ten to twenty. So selling a painting for you know five to ten thousand was a lot of money in nineteen fifty, and so they did become very very successful very quickly, and it destroyed most of them. They drank most of their money. <laughs> And after they uh, drank it and frittered it away, uh, there was nothing left. When pop art came along, Bill de Kooning was forgotten, and he never ever could get um, enough going again. And it's amazing, he was probably the hardest living and hardest drinking out of any of these guys in the New York school, but just by dumb chance, he lived. And so by the 1980s, uh, people were starting to do retrospectives of the you know these great painters from the middle of the 20th century and they started you know doing retrospectives on de Kooning, and people said hey wait a minute he's still alive <laughs> and so he's uh i'm happy to say he had a second career uh and so in the 80s people said wait a minute he's still alive and they said you know you know they started collecting and selling his works he actually got to see his stuff uh appreciated so he had this early great career collapsed when uh, pop art and conceptual art came along, you know, was pretty much starving for most of the later half of the 60s and 70s and early 80s. And then by the 80s, uh, they rediscovered him and he started painting again. He really hadn't painted that much and he's painted. And I'm going to tell you this now. I actually like his second career better. I actually do. I, I understand why people love the energy and intensity of these paintings from the 1950s. But I think his paintings from the 80s have the same kind of intensity, but they have kind of, well, they're more 80s colors. Heck, I'm an 80s kid. You know, they have the kind of neon bright colors, the day glow colors. And it showed that, you know, he still had uh, that uh, wonderful kind of quality uh, 
Uh, and so he did he did have a second career. It's kind of interesting. Uh, which brings us to one of my favorite members of the New York School, Robert Motherwell. Uh, I'm a shirt and tie kind of guy. Uh, I may be an art historian. I have the personality of a game show host, but I have the soul of an accountant. And so I like shirt and tie guys, uh, you know. I went into the arts where I could literally go to work in shorts, flip-flops, and a, and a mesh tank top, and nobody would care. <laughs> but I always wanted to go to work in a, work, in a, in a shirt and a tie. I always wanted to be a, a professional guy. I think that's why I like Robert Motherwell. So Robert Motherwell is an interesting character because he actually uh, was unlike a lot of these guys who were uh, you know, working-class Joes who came from poverty and, and worked their way up or were absolute refugees, literal refugees. He actually was born into money. He was the son of a banker. Son of a banker, grew up out, outside Seattle. Uh, his family was well-educated and well-established. And when he was a young man, he said, I want to go be an artist. And his parents said, well, why don't you go into something respectable instead, like art history? So he did. <laughs> and uh, that's why he writes the best about this stuff. He became... Uh, other than Clement Greenberg and Harold Rosenberg, the most adamant defender of abstract expressionism and the, the person who most, uh, you know, kind of elucidated and explained its methods and its ideas. So he goes and he becomes an art history student at Columbia University, and that's where he comes into contact with Meyer Shapiro. Meyer Shapiro is an art historian who knew what was going down in, you know, lower Manhattan at the time. And Meyer Shapiro says, look, you don't really want to be an art historian. You want to be an artist. Go be an artist. And so I'm sure he disappointed his parents and went and became an artist and became this world famous artist. I seem to be the only person in the world who's, I went into the arts. I started in studio arts, uh, but I seem to be the only art student in the world whose parents approved of him going into the arts. <laughs> I said, dad, I wish to be an artist. My dad was like, cool. My mother was like, awesome and i went to be an artist and i'm like dang i hate this this is boring i'm gonna be an art historian my parents were like cool and my mom was like awesome and so that's why i was a lousy artist i didn't have any of this teenage angst from my parents telling me to go into chartered accountancy or something like that uh at any rate uh so he becomes the most literary defender of the abstract expressionists as an interesting character he says most painting in the european tradition was painting the mask. Modern art rejected all that. Our subject matter was the person behind the mask. And I love that quote because what he's saying is that at the end of the day, if you're constructing geometric shapes or if you're painting an actual figure, you're not getting to this experiential quality. And he himself was very interested in, I love this photo, here he is, cigarette, you know, he'll never be this cool. Uh, cigarette narrow tie uh, with one of his paintings behind him. Uh, and he himself was trying to get to that, to get to that idea, that expression. And so early in the 1940s, uh, he's doing works relatively similar to Arshil Gorky in a way, creating shapes and forms, filling them in with color. But it's not until he gets to uh, his kind of elegy series that he really starts to find himself. He was... Uh, reading a poem by Harold Rosenberg, uh, and he starts to paint, uh, and he was doing something in sketch on pen and ink and just started scribbling. He was also very interested in Zen calligraphy, in Japanese calligraphy, which has these spontaneous forms that are created. And so he just started creating these ovoid shapes and rectangles, working them together. And he takes this original poem by Harold Rosenberg as his inspiration. A year later, he reinvents it uh, uh, to a small poem called uh, Lament for Ignacio Sanchez uh, Mejas uh, by Garcia Lorca. And these are the first in his elegy series. And the, an elegy is a poem, it's typically a poem to something that is lost. You know, you, when you read these poets from the classical age, they would have uh, poems to their elegiacal mistress. What they meant by that was, this is a woman that I can never attain and, you know, unrequited love. But also, el elegies are given in, in to expressions to things that are lost or can never be. So, like a eulogy. Uh, but an elegy is a little bit different. And so he created a whole series of these, painting furiously. And I love his paintings because you can see the energy in them. There's a reason that Harold Rosenberg called these action paintings. You can see the spatter, 
you can see the energy coming off the brush strokes. You can see that these things are painted quickly at speed. And he would paint white, and then he would paint black over the top of it, these ovoid forms. And it was very fitting to this concept of an elegy to something that was gone. Uh, he very himself was uh, kind of a devoted Marxist. Uh, the Spanish Republic was one of the first Marxist um, uh, institutions, and of course then it had the Civil War, and Franco took control and held control until the 1970s. So this is an elegy to what might have been. And so he did a whole series of these throughout his life. Again, I love how he takes these colors, the gold, the red, the blue, these were associated with, uh, you know, coat of arms and the Spanish flag at the time, and then he obliterates them with black and white, these funerary colors, um, these overwhelming funerary colors in massive scale. And you can see the energy of this. He is really trying to capture the emotion that he feels as he thinks about what's been lost. Uh, he also did a whole series called uh, the New England Elegy, and these were in remembrance of uh, Jack Kennedy. So Jack Kennedy is assassinated November 23rd, uh, 1963. And again, Jack Kennedy, Camelot, he held the hope of a nation. And so by obliterating these, you know, these, these forms and these big black horizontal forms, again, he's not trying to illustrate anything, he's trying to express. And did a whole series of those. Again, he would often create small little lithographs based on quick brushwork uh, and sketches. In the Japanese uh, calligraphy tradition and Zen calligraphy, there are these things called kanjis. And studying non-Western art, I can tell you that legibility is not all that important in Asian calligraphy. What's more important is expression. And he was, and they often have spatters and and things like that. So taking up from that, you can see these quick drips or these works where you have this spontaneous uh, spatters that are created. You're trying to capture the energy of the moment. Another one who likewise was painting in that same gestural style who was working with de Kooning but moved over into a kind of monochromatic black and white uh, palette was Franz Klein. So Franz Klein would do much the same, creating these strong black, uh, you know, striking lines over a white background. Again, spattering the paint, showing the energy, showing the motion, a lot of dry brush as well. Franz Klein was one of the first to actually use house paints because to get paint to move like this, to spatter, to flow, to show the energy of your movement, you need thinner paint and you need paint that will move. But, you know, artist paint tend to be thick and heavy bodied because you're painting slow, you're painting a little at a time. So he was painting in house paints. And uh, when he finally sold some of his first paintings, his gallery owner said, okay, enough of this. We're, we're selling art here, and people who buy art expect high-quality materials. So he went and he cleared out Franz Klein's studio, stripped out all of the house paints that he had bought at the local hardware store, and replaced them with Rembrandt's and other Rembrandt brand paints and, and high-quality stuff. And when Franz Klein got back, he had a fit, took it all, threw it away, went to the hardware store and bought himself a house paint brush and, and uh, you know, just an oil varnish, you know, house paint and went back to work. And so again, this is something that, oh, it's, it's the process and the materials communicate with it and create this kind of vitality. Again, uh, Franz Klein died too soon. I think he died of a heart attack. Which brings us to Jackson Pollock. Jackson Pollock is probably the most famous member of the New York School, and he is for a couple of reasons. One, I think he achieves the most international fame, and second, he's the hero of the movement. Clement Greenberg singles him out. You know, uh, Michelangelo had Vasari to settle him out and make him the hero of the Renaissance. Clement Greenberg picked Jackson Pollock as his Michelangelo, as the hero, the person whose expression most closely captured what Clement Greenberg was looking for in this closeness, this attempt to reach truth, in this progression towards ultimate truth. So Jackson Pollock uh, grew up in Cody, Wyoming, uh, and very much, again, poor uh, from American West, 
and they often played that up in his biography as a kind of cowboy artist. Uh, I'm not sure how much of a cowboy artist he really was. Uh, he trained under uh, uh, Thomas uh, Benton Hart, uh, and who was one of these regional painters at the uh, the New York uh, Art League and also worked extensively in the Work Projects Administration, creating things. Uh, he was deemed 4F, so he didn't get drafted for World War II. So he was hanging around New York City when all of these, you know, kind of refugees uh, come piling in. And in one of these sessions, uh, Gordon Onslow Ford, uh, a guy from England, came by to talk at um, the New York uh, Art Student League. And when he was there, he starts talking about automatism and methods of automatism, of creating spontaneous form by either scribbling or drawing. And one of the techniques that he mentions is dripping. He says, yeah, you don't even have to touch the canvas. You can drip. And this really sparked off Jackson Pollock's attention. He was at the lecture. So immediately afterwards, he and Baziotis and Kamrowski, uh, two fellow artists of his that were kind of in this group of irascibles, kind of artists in the late 30s, early 40s that were trying to change art, do this painting. And they collaborate on it. And you can see the dripping. You can see that the dripping is here and here in various places. Uh, now what's interesting is it's not the star of the show. It's kind of an accent. A lot of this is just kind of freeform uh, brushwork. But dripping will then be part of his toolkit from that time forward. So here you have a painting he did in 42, 43. And again, this is very much like kind of what the Surrealists were doing. Creating symbols, actions. These things almost look like, you know, math, uh, you know, clear diamonds, recognizable shapes. But in the background, there's the strips. You can see them. His furious strips are, are there. Uh, but this stuff was very frustrating to him, because even though you can see these drips in the background, most of his action is still furiously painting a brush on a surface. And he couldn't get the freedom that he was looking for. Here again, you can see there are drips. There are drips in the edges. You can see drips here and there. But most of this is furiously just kind of working on this uh, material and not and, and feeling constrained. I mean, he was trying to get beyond forms. And then you, know, you look at all of these, you can see he's still creating forms. He may not be creating them intentionally, he may not be creating objective forms, but he's still creating forms, and the thing is not entirely free. I think he gets a real break. Uh, Peggy Guggenheim, wealthy family, massive sponsors of the arts. They were some of these nouveau riches who were uh, really trying to set themselves apart from others by showing where uh, their tastes were, and they were real uh, enthusiasts for modern art. In fact, they were instrumental in the funding of the Museum of Modern Art, and of course then the Guggenheim Museum is created, and that's where that gets its name. And she had a home that was going up, and she had a, a massive stairwell and needed something over it, and a friend of hers said, let me recommend this guy, and so Jackson Pollock did it. And I think this is where we start to see this breakthrough moment. Here you can see it, you know, the scale of this thing. Now there are some drips here and there, but not very many of them. Mostly this is an all-over decoration and a series of rhythmic movements in the brush. And so rather than him creating forms here, he gets himself into a kind of stamp, uh, a trance. And this is very interesting. We often talk about people being in an alpha state or being in a, uh, a, uh, in, a in the zone, that is, where they lose themselves and they fall into a rhythm of doing something. Musicians describe this sports people, uh, uh, you know, uh, basketball players, all kinds of people, you know, talk about this, that they're in the zone. They actually aren't even doing anything consciously. This stuff is happening intuitively. And you can see the repeating forms over. He is 
working a kind of dance or movement over the canvas. And this is critical because this allows him to cross over. And we start to see it in this painting, Eyes in the Heat. A lot of this is still, again, applied vigorously by a brush, but we start to see the drips come to the fore. The drips are being allowed to become the central player of his compositions. And finally, 1947, 1948, is when he crosses over, where there's still some brushwork here, but most of this is him rhythmically moving the paint over the surface. Uh, Full Fathom 5 is probably the first one that you can actually start to see this. There is, again, some brushwork here. Uh, some of these heavy marks here are brushes. But most of this is drips. And then we get this layering effect, layer upon layer of drips, creating density, all of it on the surface. And this is why I think Clement Greenberg really gravitated to this, because there's no way to deny this, the truth of this. This is surface. This is just what it is. Like I've always said you can criticize Clement Greenberg for a lot of things, but the one thing you can't criticize him for is being a snob. He really did genuinely believe in the universality of this kind of expression. Abstraction, in his opinion, it's funny because most people look at abstraction and they feel kind of lost. And I know that, you know, lay people and, and people who aren't really into this don't understand it. But even my wife says, you know, of all the abstract expressionists, and she's not a fan of contemporary or modern art at all, it's, it's, a, it's a rule, uh, people. The people who put the cap back onto the toothpaste and the people who leave it off, they always get married. The people who hate contemporary art and the people who love contemporary art, they always get married too. You can't avoid it. It's just, you know, it has to be. So my wife is not a fan of a lot of the stuff I teach. But at any rate, even she says, you know, I can kind of get this. I understand what this is about. This is a kind of experience. Not her favorite, not to her taste, but she can get it. And I think that's why Clement Greenberg elevated him so much and kind of swapped out de Kooning and put in uh, Pollock as his kind of golden boy because it is just on the surface. There is nothing to understand. It is what it is. It's a kind of an experience. And it communicates something of the experience of his creation of it. It is a document of its own creation. You can see him working these paints. And of course, a lot of times, you know, when you see Jackson Pollock, um, represented in textbooks, they always show him painting. And as this started to get out in the late 1940s, people started coming to his studio, people started filming him, because they realized that there was this kind of dance-like quality, a performance-like quality to what he was doing. He would stand over the, the canvas. Now, I link to it on canvas, but I'll also link to it down below on the YouTube, but there's a very famous film by Hans Nemuth on Jackson Pollock in 1951, where he paints a painting. And I want you to go look at it, and I want you to watch it, because it gives you a sense of this. He also talks about his artwork. He talks about how he doesn't want to illustrate his feelings. He wishes to express them. He compares himself to the sand painters. Uh, he buys into that kind of Western mythos that art critics were talking about him. And some of this was BS and hype, but some of it was true. And he compares himself to the sand painters of the Navajos, that they worked close to the earth and they were creating something. Well, sand painting is a ritual action. And at the end of it, the sand painting is, is done. It's not preserved. It is today because now it's recognized in art form. But usually it's a ritual thing. And so he's at a ritual moment, which breaks the question, where is the art? Is the art on the wall or is the art in the moment of its creation. He's very famous saying that I don't paint nature, I am nature, I am creating this, I am this force. And I often think you really have to do this. I don't know if you've ever painted this way. If you're one of my art students, go get a big canvas, get the biggest canvas you can, throw it on the ground and start throwing some damn paint around. Just get a bucket, get a brush, get a mop, I don't care. And just do this. If you've never experienced this, you've got to do this. This goes true for anybody listening on YouTube. Is it one of my students? If you've never experienced this spontaneous creation of just picking up a big roller and just covering something in color without any intent in mind or throwing the paint or splashing it, if you've never done it, you got to do it. Now, what you may produce may be garbage. I'm going to be honest with you. I've done it a bunch. It's always garbage. But the experience of creating it is really incredible. 
And so it is this experiential quality. And amazingly, he gets picked up and, and he gets popularized because of this. And he gets written up. I think it's kind of, it was just so crazy. I mean, even the painters who were working vigorously, you know, like Franz Klein or Robert Motherwell, it still felt like painting. This felt like a novelty or something else. And again, because it's so abstract and it's nothing more than what it is, it kind of is has an appeal. It also has an all-over surface decoration. I mean, when you look at a Jackson Pollock, looking at a Jackson Pollock is kind of looking like snow on a screen, even though they don't have snow on a screen anymore, but except in horror movies. But, you know, uh, and it it overwhelms you. You get a deer-in-the-head-like kind of feeling looking at it. This kind of sensation is overwhelming. And I think that's why people gravitated to it. And it's important to talk about this, that the abstract expressionists, they weren't just written up in magazines for art nerds like me, for critics and, and connoisseurs in magazines like New Yorker or Burlington or, or what have you. They were written up in Life magazine. Life magazine was a mass media, mass distribution magazine. They were written up in things like Reader's Digest. They were written in all kinds of popular things, and they were, in fact, well known. And there were people creating knockoffs of this galore. Once Jackson Pollock started doing this, people started painting this way. It had both a decorative quality that people could appreciate and an expressive quality. And it really turned him into uh, a star. And so he starts numbering his paintings. He doesn't actually um, he doesn't actually give them names much, or they sometimes have names, but they're kind of nicknames. He starts numbering them, and then he renumbers them. Uh, he often comments that, you know, sometimes he would lose a painting, that, you know, it didn't turn out the way he wanted, so he'd roll it up, throw it away, which is a huge problem for collectors, because sometimes those paintings wound up in the hands of friends. And uh, there's a, I think there's a junkyard that wound up with one, and and, uh, <laughs> and they have now validated that, yeah, it is. But he didn't sign any of them, so it's very hard. So there are a few lost Pollocks out there. Um, there's a, a very famous documentary about a lady who claims to have bought one at a, at a uh, yard sale. Uh, or was it a, a thrift store? And uh, now there's people trying to verify it. But it's really interesting. So when you see these things, they do have a kind of all-over surface quality. There is nothing to look at. There is no foreground or or point or comp or focal point or composition. Now there is a sense of composition. He does respect the edges. You can see the bare canvas here. You can see how he works in rhythms. First one color and then the other. You can see the repeating rhythm of the features and how they layer up. Um, they really do become overwhelming when you look at these in detail. Uh, it's really uh, quite exceptional how much layering there is. And just seeing the way people look at them, um, it just, it involves, there's, there's no level at which this isn't satisfying. You can stand back, you can get close, it destroys all these distinctions of kind of space. And it is what it is. Again, explains why Clement Greenberg was, uh, you know, such a champion of it. Uh, but he starts to change, you know, I mean, he fully explores the drips uh, in the late 1940s, in the year 1950, but almost all of these most famous paintings are done in less than a two-year period, between 49 and 51. By 52, he is not doing pure drips anymore. He's starting to pour the paint. He's starting to get bigger, thicker areas, and you can see that when he starts interjecting some kind of control over the composition again, having liberated himself with this technique, having created it with this dance-like rhythmic motion that you really should go look at and see in the video, he starts to create solid form. In a way, he's like Malevich. Malevich had to get down to that black square before he could start introducing other colors and other forms. And so you can see he's pouring the paint in straight lines. Some of his later works, he starts creating forms, and that's really fascinating. Faces, persons, you can see the faces. Uh, hopefully you can clearly see uh, this face over here. He starts going back uh, 
to working in with the brush and the drips go back to being a bit player in a supporting role. His last paintings are very kind of, I think they're his best paintings. Uh, people started calling them poor paintings. It took broad areas of color. In many ways, I think he would have evolved into the color field. And you can see this, allowing things to go, creating compositional high points. I mean, instead of this all over surface decoration, you have this opening kind of void in the center uh, being framed by the white. But I think that helps you, I mean, and then, and then, uh, yeah, with his uh, mistress and uh, a friend of his mistress, he gets drunk and wraps his car around a tree. Uh, and uh, his mistress survives, but he kills the, uh, his mistress's uh, friend who was with him and kills himself. And it all comes to an end. It would have been very interesting to see how he would have evolved, because I think we, we concentrate on the drip. We associate him so much with the drip and the technique that we don't see that he himself would have had some breadth. Uh, I'm a big fan of Mark Tansy. Mark Tansy is uh, a postmodernist painter who also was the child of two art historians, and that will explain why you're so messed up. And he paints these very funny paintings in these kind of mono monochromatic uh, realist style, almost like documentary uh, photographs, but he shows how Jackson Pollock was like the Christ to the apostles in the boat you can see uh, Arshil Gorky here. Clement Greenberg is pointing at him, showing him the way. Here he is in his typical dripped posture. And what this, and here's Robert Motherwell looking on in interest while um, other figures look and, you know, the water looks deep and uh, this is the myth of depth. Of course, this reference is Clement Greenberg's uh, comment that, you know, we, how do we treat a painting? Do we treat a painting like a window onto a scene? No, you treat a painting like a surface because it is a surface. And Jackson Pollock was the one who truly treated it like a surface. Uh, Mark Tanzi also, uh, you know, uh, does this wonderful thing called the Triumph of the New York School, where on this side we have the early modernists. We can see Matisse and Picasso, and notice that they are dressed in the clothing of World War I. Over here, we have uh, Clement Greenberg, uh, Motherwell, uh, Jackson Pollock is here, and they are, instead of being on horses and in the clothes of World War I, they are in the clothes of World War II. And so this is a gag. It's a way of saying, yeah, the early modernists, you know, had their day, but clearly by the 1940s, by the 1950s, modernism was purely established in the United States, in New York. And it's these American or, or ex-refugees living in New York who are going to take up the mantle. I do want to point out that uh, a major supporting feature of uh, his life was Lee Krasner, who uh, herself was an accomplished painter. And after Jackson Pollock got himself killed, uh, in a drunk driving accident, she went on to have a career, and I think she carries on many of these kind of same ideas. Well, I do want to wrap this up, so let's get into Barnett Newman. Barnett Newman is there from the beginning. It's kind of interesting. You kind of have a core of artists, and that's going to be people like Gorky, uh, the Kooning, Pollock, but there's a, a kind of a periphery of artists that are hanging on as well. And one of those characters is going to be Barnett Newman. Barnett Newman is an interesting kind of sad sack figure. It, he was a, a, a failed art teacher. Uh, he could never ever pass his examinations to become uh, a professional art teacher. And so he ended up being a substitute art teacher, but was very, very frustrated for that. Uh, and he didn't have his first major ex exhibition until uh, 1951, and he didn't sell his first painting till he was 50 years old. I'm in my 50th year right now, so I, uh, I have a lot of sympathy for this approach. <laughs> so if you're a has-been, hold on. Uh, you know, if you're in your young 20s, you're one of my students in your uh, early 20s, you still got another 30 years of being a has-been before you can pull it out. I'm just teasing. Uh, and he's an interesting character because he very much was trying to find his way through this. Um, he was one of the only ones of these that wasn't a kind of womanizing drunk. He had a very dedicated wife and he had gone through a series of jobs. And finally in the late 1940s, when all the rest of this was breaking through, uh, his wife said, 
you have to pursue this. So she went back to work so that he could pursue it and dedicate it, and this is when he ended up having his first major exhibition in 1951. Uh, he said, it is our function as artists to make the spectator see the world our way, not his way. And he did that in such a reduced, minimalized way that it really is incredible. What's fascinating to me is that Barnett Newman was not considered to be amongst the premier painters in the 1950s, but by the 1960s, he was recognized for his vision and his paintings today are selling more than de Kooning's. They, they are fetching higher prices at auctions. And I think that's because abstract expressionism for all its energy was a brief moment, but his art presages the way to minimalism and to painters that came after him. So as I mentioned, he was struggling to try and find a style, to try and find an identity, and that's when he painted this painting in 1946. And he painted a single kind of white line in the midst of a field of more typically abstract expressionist uh, kind of brushwork. And he was so captivated by this, he realized that this was the direction he was going to go for. He was so committed to it that he destroyed all his previous works. We have very few paintings of his earlier style. He called these straight vertical lines zips. And they're made literally sometimes by just painting a straight line, sometimes by putting tape down, painting over the tape, or painting between two pieces of tape, and then creating these layers of color underneath it as a kind of uh, you know expression. This is a very kind of bizarre minimalist approach, and it was so bizarre that even his fellow artists at the time thought he was a fraud, thought, you know, this is, come on, you know, this is a gimmick, you know, you're not doing this. But he was earnestly sincere about this. Another feature of his paintings is the scale. The scale of the paintings are enormous. And if all of your expression is limited to these single vertical lines, then the spacing and the color of those lines become critical. And he described it as a symphony. As you go through a symphony, you'd never see the whole symphony at once. It's an experience, note by note, as you go through. And so he wanted people to walk across his paintings to see a line and then move on. And when you see people looking at his paintings, you could see that. They focus in on it. It becomes very experiential. You have this wall of color. This was a painting that he painted in 1950. This was in his first exhibition in 1951. And it's just a mammoth painting. Uh, I think it's more than 11 feet long. And it has these vertical stripes. Some are incredibly subtle and barely come out from the background. Others, as you can see, are very vibrant and enormous. And as people look at it, you can see that's how they interact with it. They interact with it through those zips. All of these paintings then try to create uh, a sensation of focus. And you can see this real intense deep blues. He's painting in many, many layers. So you have this vibrating color surface and then this bright single line. That exhibition was a complete failure. He didn't sell a single painting and he was so distraught and depressed by that, he didn't paint again, I think for another seven years. And so for seven years, he gave up. Uh, and then something amazing happened. Uh, as things started going into the 50s and the first wave of the pop artists were coming through, Clement Greenberg was kind of looking around for something to hold on. And Clement Greenberg initially kind of gave a dismissive view of Barnett Newman, but later looked at his work and said, wait a minute, there's something here. And I think that's because by the late 1950s, early 1960s, Clement Greenberg was trying to deal with the, the reality of pop art, how did it happen? And then he was trying to explain where modern art was going. And this is, he was working up to his post-gestural, uh, 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 post painterly, uh, post gestural painting show that he was going to uh, curate and put on. And as you're doing that, you look for the sources of that kind of style, and he could see that Barnett Newman was the source for this style. 
So Barnett Newman became incredibly successful, uh, but very late in his life. Alas, died in the 1960s again of a heart attack, uh, but not before he got to have this chance to influence the next generation of abstract painters. Uh, he himself was Jewish, but he was not a religious uh, Jew, but he also was very concerned about religious imagery, so he tackled probably one of his most famous pieces. Um, this would be the Stations of the Cross. And again, these are not illustrations. Uh, the Stations of the Cross is a very famous uh, kind of concept where you show various different stages of Christ in the Passion as he's going to uh, be crucified. There are various different stations. You know, there's one where the women of Jerusalem weep for him. There's another where uh, Saint Veronica presses the sweat cloth to his face and have this miraculous image. One where you know he's you know uh, whipped at the column of flagellation, and he takes all of these stations and he tries to create not an illustration but a sensation of the feeling that created. This is the third station of the cross, and the third station of the cross is associated with the, the cry, Lama Lama Sabachthani. It's like, uh, you know, this cry that Christ gives out, Oh God, why hast thou forsaken me? And so they express almost pure black and white. You almost don't need to know which station it is, because you can get the pure feeling from it. So this marks a shift. By the middle of the 1950s, uh, the abstract expressionist painters are either dead, <laughs> or they've been written off like de Kooning, <laughs> or they become successful, but they're going in a new direction, a direction that is more simple. But there's still this thing that connects them together, and it's this process, that they each chose a method that limited the output of the artist so that it could be pure expressive. Uh, for Jackson Pollock, it was his drips. For de Kooning, it was his desperation, his furious working into the canvas, over and overworking the canvas. But for Barnett Newman, it's going to be these zips. And what's going to happen is the next group of artists that pick up on this is they're going to pick up on color. And so the extension of abstract expressionism that has the longest shadow that has uh, the longest influence is going to be the color field movement. So the color field movement was these groups of artists who, uh, man, I can never spell Hans Hoffman's name right. I either put in two Fs or one N. It should be one F and two Ns. Uh, second time I've realized I've made that mistake. So don't comment it on the YouTubes, people. I'm sorry. Uh, all those defenders of Hans Hoffman, I'm sorry. I spelled his name wrong. Got to crank out several of these videos every day. So, But the color field, again, was very similar to this idea of Barnett Newman of getting expression in one area and one zone only. And you can see it in the late 50s. Hans Hoffman is starting to experience uh, experiment with pure colors. He himself was doing dripping and was dripping large areas of color, but he starts to square it off creating just zones of pure color. The person who's really going to pick up on this, however, is Mark Rothko. So Mark Rothko is a Jewish Russian American painter. He was a Russian immigrant named Marcus uh, Rothkovich, but he shortened it to Rothko. And he's active in New York, and he is on the periphery of the core of this abstract expressionist movement. I mean, he was always there. He was there in the Cedar Tavern. He was hanging out with these other individuals. And like them, he was experimenting, but in the late 1940s, he starts doing some very interesting things. He starts brushing out the edges of his areas. He never lets something hard leave hard. So while everyone else is working to this hard, expressive gesture, he starts erasing the marks of the gesture. And of course, if you don't have those spatters and dry brushing and edges, then what becomes the principal focus of the expression? It becomes the color. And he literally starts painting in layers so thin that you can't see the brushwork. And then he'll take a, a rag and soak it in turpentine and actually scrub back the edges of the paint so that you can't see the brushwork. And his 
color sections become cloud-like forms. You can actually see how the white, in this case, overlayers the black and the red. Uh, he's working in many, many thin layers and, and uh, almost gauze-like uh, glazes over the top of each other. And this creates all this subtle, radiant, vibrant energy. Eventually he realizes this is the thing that's the really exciting part of it, not the shapes, the forms. And so he starts creating his sectional paintings, and these are the paintings for which he will become, uh, you know, world famous. Uh, his sectional paintings have broad areas of color, whereas Barnett Newman had his vertical zips. Almost all of his uh, sectional paintings are going to be horizontal areas. Again, he will scrub out the edges, um, sometimes doing things, uh, leaving gestural edges, but by the time he hits the mid-1950s, he's going to be painting just intense fields of color, cloud-like forms, and no other kind of form. A painting like this doesn't have like a foreground or a background or any kind of shape. It's just an expression of color. He was also insistent that these things be hung low to the ground. All of these painters work at scale. The monumentality of abstract expressionism and color field is one of the universal characteristics of it because you want people to be assumed in the painting. And he took it a step further. He liked his paintings to be hung low to the ground so that it didn't feel like you were looking out a window. It felt like a broad expanse. It was filling your peripheral vision. He wanted people to stand that close to it. He also was, was very clear about the lighting. He generally liked the lighting low so that these things almost have a buzzing quality about them. When you see these things in the intensity of color, that becomes the communication. Now, this is something that, I'm sorry, you really can't enjoy unless you actually experience one in person. Slides just aren't going to cut it. They don't cover the same color. They don't cover the scale. It's not until you see it in, in person. I learned when I started teaching about uh, contemporary art at the Philadelphia Museum that I had to lecture about the Rothkos in the hall outside of the gallery where Rothkos were at. Because the second I got people into the hall, I had lost them because they were too caught up in the experience, this kind of throbbing experience of these intense colors. And you really can't experience it until you actually see it. As he goes on throughout the 50s and into the 60s, his palettes start to get more uh, complex. They start to get darker. And this was, uh, it's interesting that, you know, we remember Jackson Pollock and today we remember Barnett Newman, but by far, he was more successful than anybody that came out of the New York school. Uh, towards the end of his life, he was selling paintings for $100,000. Uh, that was 1970. So 1970, $100,000, insane amount of money. It's like selling paintings for millions today. And usually he didn't work for a gal he didn't gallery. He had developed such a reputation that he stopped selling through a gallery. He was just selling right out of his own studio. So, and he had dozens of paintings in his studio. Um, eventually this, be this became sparked off a, a controversy when he died, but we'll talk about that in a minute. And he received an enormous commission towards the end of the 1950s, a commission to decorate the Four Seasons restaurant. The Four Seasons restaurant was located at the top of this, the Seagram's building. The Seagram's building was designed by Mies van der Rohe. Mies van der Rohe was the last um, director of Bauhaus when it was in Berlin, and he was the founder of the international style school of architecture. So by the 1950s, modernism is utterly triumphant. The buildings, the ideas of modernism in Bauhaus are being used to build skyscrapers. The skyscraper is what it is. It is steel and glass. It is true to the form. It is true to the materials and surface. There's nothing beneath it. It is what it is. And what a perfect place for a painting. And all of this comes together. I'm sad that the Four Seasons restaurant is gone. Uh, you know, it, it was an institution for my life and now it's gone. But the reason it was called the Four Seasons is it was this idea that, you know, the same ideas of modern painting of something being true to what it is happened to food as well. And in food, they decided we're going to serve seasonal food instead of these complex French sauces and 
and fussy kind of recipes. We're going to have simple recipes that highlighted the food and the quality of, of food in season. And it was really kind of a pioneering idea. And the aesthetic of the building and the aesthetic of the restaurant was 100% modern. You know, no moldings, no crown moldings. Everything is glass or steel or wood or pure veneer. And there actually was, at this location, uh, there actually was at this location a very famous work by Picasso. Uh, Picasso painted a backdrop for a play, and that backdrop was part of this. But that was felt like it didn't fit. It wasn't this pure modernist aesthetic that they were looking for. So they commissioned a series of paintings by Mark Rothko for this location. Uh, and I think the commission was six figures. It was enormous for the day. Absolutely insane commission. Uh, but it fell through. Uh, there was a disagreement between Rothko and the Four Seasons, and eventually uh, he didn't want them to be displayed there, and so they wound up in the Tate um, Gallery, and eventually the Tate Modern. And he put them in there with the agreement that they would, in fact, uh, place them according to his desires, that they be low to the ground, that they have low lighting, uh, and so it's a weird experience going there because, you know, it's this low lighting and it's strange, you know, they're not terribly well lit. You kind of have to get close to them. So in a way, like I'm, what I'm, the reason I'm telling you this and going into such detail is because it shows how the abstract expressionists themselves were, and the color field painters, were moving into this experiential format. And... And in a way, the crossover to performance is not as crazy as we might think. One of his last major uh, commissions was to create a series of paintings uh, for the Menil Foundation. Uh, Houston was in the middle of an oil boom. Oil means money, money means art. <laughs> if you, you can see where all the great uh, art museums and you can tell exactly when the economy was booming in each of those cities because that's when the Contemporary Art Museum gets built. So Houston, Dallas, they have all these contemporary art museums that are being built from the 60s and the 70s and that's because that was the oil boom. Anyhow, so this was supposed to be a non-denominational meditational chapel. Uh, the obelisk out front is by Barnett Newman. They were uh, the family, the Neil family was great patrons of contemporary art. And this was the last major commission that he was given. It was not installed until after his death because the chapel wasn't quite finished. But he painted these 14 massive paintings. And in these, they're, it's really quite incredible. At times they appear to be brown, at times they appear to be blue. They are so layered, and again, with this gauze-like, kind of cloud-like, uh, numinous kind of quality that you really can't photograph them. You have to experience them in person. Uh, many people have written about Mark Rothko and how, as he's gone in his life, he's actually uh, works towards a darker palette, uh, more complex layering. And this was probably an indication of his increasing depression, anxiety, and alcoholism. Uh, he had a very bad split uh, with his wife. He was alienated from his wife and his daughter. And so in 1970, I believe, he uh, uh, went to his studio uh, and he committed suicide. Now here's where I have to debunk a myth that I was taught. And that, you know, the story goes that he carefully put his clothes to his side and he slit his wrists and laid the blood out and that the blood looked like a Mark Rothko painting, that he kind of committed a ritual uh, suicide and used his own blood to make his last great work. That's a myth. It's not true. The truth is he was in underwear and that was part of his regular routine and he just committed suicide. That myth kind of gets pushed out there by uh, the people who inherited his foundation because they inherited his foundation and they basically used it to line their own pockets and screw the Rothko family and his daughter out of anything uh, of his legacy. And there's a very famous court case where Rothko's daughter basically fights to preserve Rothko's legacy. So maybe you are seeing this man's, you know, many people have commented that you see his depression, his angst, his anxiety, his, you know, fear of the end right there in this work of art. Uh, and it, it really is powerful. I know I can't really explain it to people. You have to go see it in person. Uh, Peter Gabriel, famous musician. Uh, wasn't really particularly a fan of this kind of art. 
and he went and saw it in person and it was so moving it was so uh, a kind of an interesting experience that he actually wrote a song about it 14 black paintings so if you're a fan of Peter Gabriel that's where that intersects with Mark Rothko so just briefly uh, we also ought to mention Helen Frankenthaler Helen Frankenthaler was there again with the New York School she married uh, Robert Motherwell and she too was working in a color field but in her case she would pour out a thin wash of paint with a lot of thinner and then charge it back with color and again this is another way of letting the painting and the process take control over what's happening so that you have these areas and fields of intensity of color and then these things would be evocative of certain forms whether it was a bay or a canyon and that's how she would give it this title but you can actually see the flow and the movement of the paint morris lewis for his point uh, for his part would uh, put stains of paint on a canvas that was tilted and he would see the paint pour down you can see the drips and layer a layer over the top of it jules olitsky was doing much of the same thing so by the time we reach the year 1950 uh, modernism is utterly and completely triumphant and by the time we reach the year 1960 it's not just triumphant it's everywhere it is every phase of design the buildings our houses our clothing uh, our consumer products our cars all of them had fully embraced this idea of modernist design and you have to understand that before we can go on to what happens in conceptual and pop art why it's such a revolution and why um, they revolted against it it's because for so long modernism had defined itself as the avant-garde but when you are making six-figure commissions creating uh, things for the excuse me if you're getting seasick creating things for the four seasons uh, for these modernist buildings you can no longer say that you are the avant-garde you are the establishment and the other thing is that it was so successful that everybody was painting this way everybody was trying to mimic the success and sudden popularity of a Pollock, de Kooning, a Rothko, etc. making it impossible to get any attention because if everybody is painting that way and the painting is so defined by abstraction how do you get any oxygen how do you get any attention as an artist and so we always have to remember artists are businessmen <laughs> and they're they're artists and they have ideologies but they also got to eat <laughs> and so how do you break through how do you gain attention when the whole world is like that and there were a very few people at the top and no way to break in so the only way to break is to do something different so clement greenberg's vision that not only had art achieved truth but that it would stay this way forever really comes crashing down around his ears uh, beginning in the mid-1950s but really escalating as we get into the 60s and we'll save that story for next time thanks so much i know this was a long one i know there's a lot of lectures this week but hang in there i'm gonna kind of drill in uh, a little deeper next time i know it's been a real slog uh, getting to the point where we can finally start to talk about how contemporary art gets uh, sparked off. But thanks for hanging in there. Ciao.